So welcome everyone. Today we are excited to continue our monthly series focused on clinical trials in glomerular disease. The series was developed as a collaborative effort between NEFCURE, Kennedy International, the IGA Foundation, and the Gateway Initiative Clinical Trial Collaborative. With additional support from the Kidney Health Initiative and the American Society of Nephrology. As some of you may recall, we opened the series last month with a session called Clinical Trials 101, which was an overview of the elements of clinical trial design and execution and a blueprint of how to ultimately bring novel therapies to patients. Over the next few months, each month we will focus on a specific disease and elaborate on the novel developments and treatment with highlights of the actual clinical trials for each disease. Our first disease state is appropriately the most common primary glomerular disease worldwide, IJ nephropathy. Of course, the irony is that despite its prevalence, there remains considerable gaps in our understanding of how to best target the disease to achieve appropriate kidney protection. In this session, we hope to shed some light on pioneering efforts to overcome this difficulty. We truly have a, a, a star-studded lineup with four world-renowned authorities on IG nephropathy that have been gracious enough to spend the next hour with us and share their knowledge. To start, we have Dr. Dana Risk. She will provide our context, outlining the essentials of IGA pathobiology, epidemiology, and risk stratification, as well as reviewing the current state of management. Uh, next, we have Dr. Heather Reek. She will present on current understanding of targets and pathways for new drug development in IGA nephropathy. Uh, following Dr. Reek, we'll have two speakers highlighting two of the active clinical trials currently recruiting for patients with IG nephropathy and the rationale for those potentially groundbreaking agents. First, we'll have Dr. Jonathan Barrett presenting the Neficon study, a randomized controlled trial of oral budesonide and high-risk IG nephropathy. And lastly, we'll have Dr. Richard Lafayette, who will highlight the role of complement in IG nephropathy with focus on the clinical trials of nosoplumab, a monoclonal antibody directed at the lectin pathway of complement. Our moderators today include a representative of the patient voice, Bonnie Schneider, who's founder and director of the IG Nephropathy Foundation of America. Prior to the session, she invited patients and families to submit questions via the IG Foundation Facebook page, and Bonnie will present selected questions to our panel. We also have, as before, Dr. Kirk Campbell, Associate Professor of Medicine and Director of Nephrology for Fellowship Program at the ICANN School of Medicine in Mount Sinai, Dr. Ali, Ali Poyanmir, of course, the founder of GlomCon, from the Permanente Medical Center, Kaiser Permanente Medical Center in San Francisco, myself, Sunil Yudani, and uh, Josh Tarnoff, CEO of NEFCURE Kidney International. So before we begin, I'd like to once again invite Josh from NEFCURE to speak about the Gateway Initiative and the goals of these efforts. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you for the very kind introduction and the comments today. And uh, on behalf of NEFCURE, as well as the IGA Foundation, uh, we're honored to be partnering with the GLOMCOM series. As some of you may not know, if you're joining us for the first time, Nephew Kidney International is a research-based patient advocacy organization, uh, somewhat some forming as the center of the wheel, bringing together academia, government agents such as the FDA and NIH, along with industry. Some of the, the, the genesis of the Gateway Initiative, if you're not familiar with it, over the past year or so, there's been an explosion in the number of glomerular disease trials specifically in the nephrotic and nephritic syndrome. We're currently at over 20 of these trials, six of which are IGA nephropathy based. Now, this is up from literally three, only three years ago. And again, most of this is changing from the regulatory guidance with the FDA, uh, allowing the acceptance of proteinuria, the surrogate biomarker for EGFR and, uh, and outcomes. What I would ask is, uh, if you haven't had a chance, please do check the website under kidneyhealthgateway.com. Uh, it is not just for patients, but it also for clinicians to get familiar with the available clinical trials that are there and to see if your patients qualify, as we do desperately need your help to recruit for these trials that we'll be discussing today. Uh, so again, on behalf of NEFCURE and the IGA Foundation, uh, thank you for your participation. Thank you, Josh. Um, so we should get started. Our, our first speaker, as mentioned, is Dr. Dana Risk. Dr. Risk is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Alabama at Birmingham in the Division of Phrology. She obtained her medical degree at the American University of Beirut in Beirut, Lebanon. She then came to the United States where she was in St. Louis University, 
subsequently transferred to Emory University where she completed a residency, chief residency, and nephrology fellowship. In 2008, Dr. Riss joined the faculty at UAB as a clinical nephrologist providing patient care um, in the inpatient and outpatient setting. She has been involved in the training and mentoring of many fellows and is a recipient of several awards for excellence in teaching. Dr. Risk is involved in clinical research and since 2015, serves as the Director of Clinical Trials Research in the Division of Nephrology. Her main research interests are appropriately IG nephropathy and ADPKD. Thank you, Dr. Risk, for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction and for the invitation today. It's my pleasure um, to start off with this conference. Uh, as you well know, the disease was first described in 1968 by a French pathologist by the name of Jean Berger. And in fact, the disease for the longest was coined Berger's disease. Uh, he described the, the entity along with Nicole Anglais, who was an electron microscopist uh, in France as well. And the hallmark of the disease uh, was really pathologic finding in particular on immunofluorescence the presence of IgA mesangial deposits uh, that are, uh, have to be dominant or the co-dominant immunoglobulin uh, on kidney biopsy. Uh, this is often accompanied with C3 deposition, uh, sometimes uh, IgG in about a third to 40% of cases and uh, occasionally IgM deposition as well. By light microscopy, the hallmark of the disease is mesangial proliferation. This is, uh, and the hypercellularity noted best on PAS stain, as you can see in panel B. And in panel C, you can see electron microscopy findings of electron dense deposits, again, in the mesangial area. Next slide, please. Uh, so as mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, it's the most frequent primary glomerulonephritis in the United States and in the world. The real prevalence of the disease is unknown for a couple of reasons that I'm going to highlight. Number one, there are studies, uh, autopsy series on patients that died tragically and did not have any known uh, kidney problems, uh, as well as case series from uh, kidney allografts that were biopsied at the time of implantation. Again, uh, presumably these patients have been worked up for transplant donation and had no evidence of nephritis. And despite this, uh, renal IgA deposits were noted in about five to 15% of these uh, kidney autopsy specimen or biopsies, suggesting that perhaps there are patients uh, around with subclinical disease that uh, either fare very well or may later on develop the disease, but uh, the disease may start way earlier than we think. So the true prevalence of the disease is unknown. The annual incidence in the United States, at least, is estimated to be one in 100,000 persons. Uh, the disease gender distribution seems to be different in the United States versus Asia, for example, where there's a male preponderance in the United States, whereas there's a more equal gender distribution uh, in East Asia. Uh, this, this difference for uh, gender distribution is not quite uh, understood. It's a frequent cause of ESRD, so glomerulonephritis is the third leading cause of NCG disease in the United States, for example, following uh, diabetes and hypertension and IgA being the most common GN uh, among that group. Next slide, please. Uh, if we look at the worldwide prevalence of IgA nephropathy, uh, it varies significantly. So this is a map illustrating the percentage of native kidney biopsies uh, showing IgA nephropathy. And you can see uh, that uh, this is much higher uh, in Asia, in particular East Asia, where the percentage of IgA nephropathy found on native kidney biopsies is estimated to be 40 to 50%. Uh, then you move to Europe where that um, prevalence drops to 20 to 30%. And in North America, it's around 3 to 10%. Having said that, I would point out that the uh, practice of performing kidney biopsies varies widely among these countries and these continents as well. It is not uncommon, for example, in Japan to have a kidney biopsy done solely on the presence of hematuria, um, whereas in the United States, we almost never biopsy somebody that has 
uh, only hematuria and no proteinuria. So it may be that uh, the prevalence is not that disparate, but there's certainly a genetic predisposition um, for the disease that varies across the world. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that the disease is extremely rare in Africa, in particular in Central Africa. Next slide, please. Um, so who are the patients that we need to worry about or uh, treat uh, once we make the diagnosis? Uh, so in general, patients with little or no proteinuria have a low risk of disease progression. That's part of the rationale for not biopsying patients that have only hematuria. Uh, and in part, it's the fact that at least so far, we have not had disease-specific treatment also. Um, so subjecting the patients to a biopsy becomes less um, uh, I mean, I guess we, we're less uh, uh, likely to subject the patient to the risk of biopsy. Patients, on the other hand, who develop overt proteinuria or have an elevated creatinine uh, will progress and reach end-stage renal disease. And it's estimated that about 50 to 20% will develop ESRD at 10 years and about 20 to 30% reach ESRD at 20 years. And given that the peak incidence of the disease is in patients that are in their 30s, uh, that still could be quite a devastating uh, prognosis. Uh, so the known risk factors for disease progression as of today are persistent proteinuria. So patients that have uh, certainly <laughs> more than a gram uh, of uh, protein per day uh, but uh, possibly even more than 500 milligrams despite uh, renin-angiotensin blockade are at risk. People that have an abnormal EGFR, people that have hypertension. And we have a pathologic uh, classification uh, for IgA nephropathy that you may be familiar with, uh, I'm sure, um, abbreviated as the MEST score, uh, with M standing for mesanger hypercellularity, E, endocapillary hypercellularity, S, segmental glomerulosclerosis, E, tubular interstitial fibrosis, and C, for the presence of crescents. And each one of those um, letters or you know, acronyms uh, represents a pathologic finding uh, and is scored accordingly. Uh, the higher the score, the worse usually the <laughs> prognosis. That's particularly true for people that have segmental sclerosis and tubular interstitial uh, fibrosis. A uh, high degree of crescents also portends a poor prognosis and a rapidly progressing disease. Uh, more recently, uh, Sean Barber and uh, some of my colleagues here on the panel have uh, published a very nice IGN prediction tool that can be used at the time of uh, biopsy to predict who's going to progress uh, and have um, a poor renal outcome defined as a 50% EGFR decline or progression to end-stage renal disease in a five to seven years uh, time frame. And uh, the nice thing about it is, uh, first, it's available as an app, so it's easily usable and it uh, requires information that is easily accessible to any clinician. Uh, so the variables used in the prediction tool uh, are EGFR at the time of biopsy, systolic and diastolic blood pressure at the time of the biopsy, uh, proteinuria, age, race, uh, the use of RAS blockade or renin-angiotensin um, blo blockers at the time of biopsy, the MEST score, they did not include the crescents because they did not have uh, all the data available in their um, validation and the, um, the, the init their initial cohort. Um, and uh, you can also include the use of immunosuppression at or before the time of biopsy. So the prediction tool can be used with or without uh, the race information. They both perform fairly well. Uh, and again, it's a great way to be able to select patients uh, that are at risk of progression and therefore would benefit most from treatment or participation in clinical trials. Next slide. Uh, so as of uh, 2019, uh, we still don't have a disease specific treatment for IgA nephropathy uh, and hence the impetus to move uh, the field forward and um, you know, push these clinical trials forward. Um, the treatment so far is based off of the KDGO guidelines from 2012 that are about to be updated is my understanding. 
Uh, but so far, uh, it includes non-immunosuppressive uh, treatment, in particular ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers in per patients that have persistent proteinuria at more than one gram a day for sure. Uh, the use of fish oil is, uh, has not, the benefit of using fish oil is not clearly established. However, there is some data to uh, support its use, <coughs> little harm from it, so we invariably uh, will um, offer patients uh, fish, fish oil if they can tolerate it. The, the tonsillectomy or the practice of tonsillectomy uh, really has not been, um, it, it is very controversial again. There is lack of high quality data to support its use. Uh, it's only been studied as an adjunct <coughs> therapy, often on a background of steroid treatment. And it is conceivable, at least uh, some of the data suggests that it may be beneficial in a subset of patients with specific racial or ethnic background, in particular Asians, uh, as opposed to Caucasians, for example, uh, where data from the Valiga study did not confirm the benefit of undergoing tonsillectomy. Next slide. Uh, how about immunosuppressive therapy? Uh, where steroids have probably been uh, studied the most, uh, I will only mention two major trials uh, published in the last five years or so. The STOP IGAN trial uh, that was published in the New England Journal uh, included patients who had uh, proteinuria of 0.75 uh, up to a subnephrotic range of proteinuria per day, and EGFR is between 30 to 90 milliliters per minute per 1.73 meters square. These patients uh, were initially subjected to six months of supportive uh, treatment that included diet modification, uh, blood pressure control, low salt diet, ACE and ARB uh, use, uh, and titration. At the end of the six months, they were then randomized to either supportive care versus steroids if they had preserved EGFR or cytoxan, imuran, and steroid if their EGFR was between 30 and 59. It's worth mentioning that after the six months of run-in period where patients got uh, significant supportive treatment, about a third of patients were no longer eligible uh, to be enrolled or randomized, primarily because their proteinuria improved significantly. Uh, again, emphasizing the importance of uh, lifestyle modifications in our patient population. Uh, but more importantly, at the end of the trial, there was a little bit of reduction in proteinuria and prednisone monotherapy, uh, or a significant reduction, I should say, but there was no difference in EGFR decline during the trial. And importantly, there was significantly higher adverse events in the immunosuppression arm. So again, some benefit at the expense of uh, adverse events. Next slide. Uh, the testing trial uh, that again enrolled patients with persistent proteinuria of more than one gram per day after three months of supportive care uh, and titration of uh, ACE inhibitor and angiotensin receptor blockers uh, included patients that had EGFRs between 20 to 120 milliliter per minute per 1.73 meter square. And here patients were randomized at the end of the supportive uh, care period to oral methylprednisolone versus placebo. Um, unfortunately, the recruitment had to be stopped early because of excessive serious adverse events uh, in the treatment arm, uh, mostly infections that were reported at 14.7% in the treatment group compared to 3.2% in the placebo group. So quite a significant increase in infection rate. Uh, so, of course, no conclusion can be drawn about renal outcomes or whether there was any benefit, but we certainly saw a trend uh, in improvement uh, of renal outcomes in the treatment arm, uh, where the renal outcome or deterioration in kidney function was noted in 5.9% of uh, patients treated with steroids versus 15.9% uh, in the placebo arm. No conclusion can be drawn because, again, uh, the trial had to be stopped early and they did not reach target enrollment. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that um, mostly or most of the patients that were enrolled were from China. So, again, uh, perhaps suggesting that there is an ethnic, um, uh, that the treatment may differ in different ethnic uh, subgroups. Um, and going forward, they're trying to 
you know, restart the study, or they did restart the study with lower prednisone doses and also Bactrim prophylaxis uh, to prevent infectious complications. So we'll see if that pans out. Next, uh, next slide. Uh, how about other immunosuppressives? Uh, so uh, mycophenolate mofetil or Celsept, uh, no data to support its use in uh, Caucasians uh, based on the AGK AJKD uh, trial published um, in 2015. It may be of benefit here again in Asians um, and patients with histologically active lesions, particularly those with endocapillary hypercellularity. Uh, in that trial, it was used with low-dose steroids, so perhaps it can be used as an adjunct uh, as, and used as a steroid sparing therapy, um, so uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, rituximab uh, did not show any benefit, and, uh, no, ef no effect on proteinuria or EGFR in a trial that was uh, led by one of my colleagues on the panel, uh, Richard Lafayette. Uh, so no support uh, to use it. Next slide. Uh, so where do we go from here? Um, we still, again, as mentioned in the introduction, have a long way to go and to learn how to treat this disease. Uh, it's worth mentioning that, uh, you know, IgA can be isolated to the kidneys and that's what we call IgA nephropathy or it could have systemic manifestations, what's uh, used to be known as HSP or henoch shonline purpura. Uh, the more recent name for it is IgA vasculitis with nephritis. Um, all the tri so a lot of HSP patients end up, you know, having resolution of their systemic manifestations, but are left with IgA nephropathy or some degree of hematuria and proteinuria. And those have been systematically excluded from all trials, so we still don't know how to treat uh, this subset of patients. Um, so going forward, it's a, it's a subgroup that definitely needs to get some attention. Uh, we definitely need a better understanding of the disease pathogenesis. I did not have time to go through our current understanding of uh, uh, the disease pathobiology, uh, but that will help us identify a new uh, targets for uh, drug therapy, and I think Heather is going to go through some of those for sure. Um, we need to uh, understand why patients sometimes have just IgA deposition and some progress to develop disease. Uh, again, uh, elucidating these things will help us uh, with treatment modalities. Um, the Kidney Health Initiative helped uh, uh, spark uh, the interest in clinical trials as we can now use surrogate outcomes and shorten the duration of the trials uh, using proteinuria as the surrogate outcome uh, predicting uh, kidney dysfunction. Uh, we need to do a better job selecting patients for trials, so hopefully we can now use personalized prediction models. Uh, there are clearly racial and ethnic differences in response to treatments, and we still don't know the value of hematuria uh, in patients that have low level of proteinuria but seem to uh, still have active and active urine sediment. And finally, we uh, definitely need to develop disease-specific biomarkers to assess disease activity and treatment response, uh, which would be extremely helpful in clinical trial. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Reish for the next section. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Rizik. Um, so we'll uh, uh, transition uh, to Dr. Heather Risha, who um, is at uh, uh, the University of uh, Toronto. She is the um, Gaber Zellerman Chair in Nephrology Research and an Associate Professor. Um, Dr. Risha will be uh, discussing uh, novel targets and pathways for drug development uh, in IgA nephropathy. And this will uh, be a nice uh, segue into discussing uh, two uh, active clinical trials that are in, in phase three. So, Dr. Rich, welcome. Thank you. Um, I have our clinic uh, staff sitting here with us today, a lot of house staff, so good learning environment. Um, so today I'm going to talk very briefly about our understanding of the pathogenesis of IgA nephropathy, which explains uh, the rationale for development of some really interesting compounds uh, to treat this disease. And as you can tell uh, from the nature of this talk, it's an exciting time in IgA nephropathy uh, because we actually now have uh, 
really a, a flurry of uh, new clinical trials available investigating uh, various pathways and mechanisms of mediation of uh, kidney injury and IgA. Um, next slide, please. So uh, you may be familiar with the multi-hit hypothesis regarding IgA nephropathy and the number of hits continues to uh, increase and so it's maybe beyond the four-hit hypothesis now, but it remains an important framework um, that makes it helpful to understand the uh, pathogenesis of IgA nephropathy. Uh, I would divide uh, really the, the concepts into the immunologic or immunopathogenesis side of the disease development and then the injury side of uh, disease development. And on the injury side, of course, we have many pathways that are shared common pathways of other uh, uh, results of glomerular injury, such as glomerulosclerosis and tubulointerstitial fibrosis. Um, and so today I'll mostly be focusing on the immune uh, related pathways, but uh, of course to be mindful that chronic injury remains an important area of potential research interest um, and drug development. So on the far left side of the screen would be uh, the triggering or initiating elements in the immunopathogenesis of disease. And you may be able to see uh, some little blue uh, stars which are supposed to represent Micro, uh, microbiota or bacteria, pathogenic and non-pathogenic bacteria. And we are separated, our bloodstream is separated from uh, a very large population of bacteria by a single epithelial layer. And as a result, we have uh, evolved to have a um, immediately responding uh, immune mechanism to uh, prevent entry of bacteria into the bloodstream. And of course, one of the main points of contact with bacteria and our immune system is at the level of the gut, um, as well as the respiratory tract. So uh, there is a close relationship and IgA secretion into the lumen of the small bowel is the primary line of defense against invasion of mucosal uh, bacteria. But it's really the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue uh, that is responsible for production of the largest quantity of IgA in the, bo in the body, but also um, is thought to be the source of IgA at the moment in IgA nephropathy, because some of the characteristics of the IgA that is produced by the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue is uh, seen in the immune complexes within the kidney and circulation of patients with IgA nephropathy. And so the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue is the aggregates of lymphoid tissue just below the mucosal surface that you can see represented here. And key in this uh, process is the activation of B cells to become IgA secreting cells. And I'll go into this in a little bit more detail in the next slides, but suffice it to say that B cell activation to produce IgA physiologic and of course pathologic conditions uh, occurs by both T cell dependent and T cell independent mechanisms. And cytokines are very important in this process because it helps uh, determine B cell commitment to IgA production and also B cell proliferation. Um, I've put April here as one of the key cytokines. Uh, BAF would be the other cytokine involved in this process, as I'll go into in a moment. Um, but April uh, is uh, of note. It's also note of TNF superfactor 13. That's the other name for it. And it's of interest in particular because genetic variants in the April gene have been associated with IgA nephropathy risk. Um, and levels of April uh, and BAF have been associated with disease severity. So, of course, the uh, commitment of B cells to IgA uh, secreting cells is essential for mucosal immune defense. And the IgA that's produced at the mucosal interface tends to be polymeric in nature. 
and that allows it to be uptaken by a polymeric IgA receptor, which then spits out the IgA complexes into the lumen of the bowel or respiratory system, and that mops up bacteria, allowing GI elimination and preventing entry into the bloodstream. The IgA in IgA nephropathy, as you can see moving over to the right side of the panel, uh, has some interesting characteristics. It tends to be, as I mentioned, polymeric, um, but it also tends to be under glycosylated at uh, the hinge region. And so galactose deficient immune uh, complexes of IG, polymeric IgA characterize patients with IgA nephropathy, although Relatives of patients with IgA nephropathy and IgA vasculitis may also have similar IgA characteristics. This uh, polymeric IgA1 that is under galactosylated uh, tends to uh, promote the development of autoantibodies, which are IgG, directed against galactose deficient IgA1. And for those of you who have a bit more immunology background, you may be, it may be surprising to hear that an IgA uh, antibody can activate and fix complement, and that is true. And so it's thought that the immune complex with IgG uh, and perhaps the uh, polymeric nature as well are the elements that make uh, these immune complexes capable of activating complement pathways. Um, this, these pathway, these immune complexes, pardon me, uh, tend to contain components of the complement pathway uh, and are nephritogenic, so causing local glomerular uh, mesangial cell uh, and endocapillary cell proliferation and ultimately some of the shared downstream pathways. So we don't really know the triggers uh, for production of pathogenic IgA. We know that there are clearly some uh, genetic risk alleles. The tendency towards autoantibody formation, for example, may be dictated by HLA genotype. I've mentioned the April uh, genotype. And in the complement side, as well, there are uh, genetic risk variants associated with the alternate pathway of complement activation specifically complement factor H related uh, protein genes, which uh, tend to cause dysregulation and inhibit turning off of the alternate pathway. Um, and so I'll just briefly go through in the next slide, please, um, each of these pathways and the rationale for development. So as I mentioned, the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue is the major site of IgA production. And uh, gen genetic uh, studies also show that some of the susceptibility loci, uh, some of which I've mentioned and uh, additional uh, loci, are actually shared with inflammatory bowel disease. And so there are likely uh, shared pathways um, with uh, aberrant mucosal immune responses that contribute both to IgA nephropathy risk as well as IBD risk. Bacteria are essential in shaping the immune system. Uh, mice who are reared without bacteria uh, have a distinctly different immune system and immune response compared to those who are uh, reared with uh, commensal bacteria. And uh, similarly in humans, our mucosal system, immune system is shaped very closely by interactions and constant sampling between our mucosal immune system and luminal uh, bacteria. We've not yet isolated uh, particular bacteria of interest. However, a combination of the type of bacteria as well as the mucosal immune response likely contribute. And in the future, this uh, may be an important target for uh, therapy, although as I mentioned, the it's not clear that we're going to identify one particular pathogenic bacterium. Bacteria, interestingly, also produce IgA1 proteases, and there's been some uh, promotion of using bacterial-derived proteases uh, as a therapy in mouse models of IgA nephropathy. And uh, I've just provided that reference, but again, that's not at prime time at the moment. 
In terms of addressing the mucosal immune response, this is really the rationale for local corticosteroid treatment with Neficon, which Dr. Barrett will be uh, expanding upon. And Neficon will have its greatest uh, activity at the terminal ileum, where we have the greatest concentration of payers patches and some of the processes that I'll talk to you about in the next slide. Go to the next slide, please. So B cell activation, as I mentioned, can happen by T cell dependent and independent active, uh, processes. And T cell related activity, of course, will be influenced by our current medications such as corticosteroids, uh, mycophenolate, and our usual anti T cell uh, medications. When we're looking at T cell independent activation and to some extent some T cell activation as well. Um, that's where some of the candidates that you will hear about, uh, including the cytokines that cause B cell differentiation and activation, become implicated. So um, BAF uh, and uh, April are important in mediating class B cell class switch and uh, allowing naive B cells to undergo activation and become committed IgA producing uh, cells. And we can modulate these pathways using uh, new medications. So for example, we have BAF specific inhibitors such as belimumab or Benlista, uh, a humanized monoclonal antibody that binds soluble BAF uh, and has been used in successfully in lupus studies. Uh, there is a, uh, an Anthera product that has been, had been tested, uh, but the phase three study in, in IgA was withdrawn um, as a BAF inhibitor. In addition, if you want to interfere with signaling, you can see on the top right corner of the uh, figure, BAF and April exert their effects through a variety of unique and shared receptors, and the TACI receptor uh, mediates signaling by both BAF and April. And, uh, and then uh, the effects on B cell activity and IgA production are mediated by NF kappa B. And so, directly inhibiting or blocking the effects of the TACI uh, receptor or mopping up the BAF in April prior to binding are another potential target for therapy. And there is a, a drug, Atacacept, a compound available for human uh, use. It has been used in the MS uh, literature, not terribly successfully, uh, with some results as well in lupus. There have been over a thousand people treated with these, uh, this compound. However, there have been some concerns with respect to infection risks and in immune globulin uh, level reduction. And so that will be uh, an ongoing uh, area of interest. Next slide. Uh, plasma cells uh, are another interesting potential target. And as I'll show in a moment, uh, we're not sure which cells are the cells that are producing the IgA. Um, and indeed, the failure of effect of rituximab is of biologic interest as well. And so if we're looking at more plasma cell directed therapy, uh, proteasome inhibitors are of course uh, an interesting candidate and are um, there is under, ongoing clinical trials uh, in IgA nephropathy. They induce proteasome uh, inhibition, which results directly in cell apoptosis as part of the unfolded protein response. Um, but as well, Velcade and, uh, appears to have some anti-inflammatory effects directly through uh, inhibition of activation of NF-kappa B. And so some interesting potential biologic mechanisms, but with, uh, as you're likely all familiar, some significant toxicity. And next slide. Uh, this slide I won't go through in extensive detail, um, but I have provided the reference to indicate that we're still not sure whether plasma cells, plasma blasts, 
or other uh, uh, cells are the primary culprit in pathogenic IgA production. And not all of these cells are uh, CD19 and CD20 positive. And this may account for the uh, not overwhelming uh, response to rituximab in this disease. Next slide. And this is the final uh, slide, which it, uh, I'll point you to an excellent review by Dr. Risk, uh, who, my, our colleague on the call, on complement pathway in IgA nephropathy. Uh, as she has already mentioned, classical lectin and alternative pathway uh, are implicated in IgA nephropathy. And what's written here in blue on the left-hand side is the molecule uh, targets of some compounds under development that are being trialed in IgA nephropathy. Uh, on the left-hand panel is a review of the full uh, pathway of complement activation, including multiple ways of actually activating the pathway uh, and final common uh, production of C5B9. But on the right-hand side uh, is a mirror image of this diagram, which was generated from a paper looking at uh, proteomic evaluation of kidney biopsy tissue from patients with IgA nephropathy. And complement still remains a bit a culprit of association with IgA nephropathy. We don't understand a lot about how IgA uh, activates complement and how complement contributes to disease progression. It does not appear to be isolated to the alternate pathway. All elements of complement activation pathways have been observed uh, to be more abundant and to be expressed in the biopsies of patients with IgA nephropathy. And in the dark orange pathway, uh, orange color on the right hand side, these are all the elements uh, of the complement pathway that were isolated in kidney tissue of patients that had progressive disease compared to non-progressive disease. And so we're not sure if the alternate pathway is the only pathway. As I mentioned, it's the one with the genetic association, um, but all of the pathways have been uh, associated, uh, or products of the pathway have been associated with pathogenesis of IgA nephropathy. And I, I think that's a good transition point for the next topic. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rish, and uh, for that great overview and sort of look to the future. Um, along those lines, we'll spend the next two sessions discussing some more specific clinical trials. First will be Dr. Jonathan Barrett, who's a mayor professor of renal medicine at the University of Leicester in the United Kingdom. Uh, he is the member of the steering committee for the International IgA Nephropathy Foundation, I'm sorry, IgA Nephropathy Network. He's a chief investigator in multiple randomized controlled trials. Um, and so we will be eager to hear his uh, perspective on the Neficon study. So thanks very much uh, for this opportunity to talk. I'm going to main talk about the Neficard study, which is currently recruiting globally and is a phase through three study in um, looking at the safety and efficacy of Neficon in patients with primary IgA nephropathy. So if you could, uh, so as Heather has alluded to, I think from the very early days of IgA nephropathy being first described, it was well recognized that one of the peculiarities of this disease was that within 24 to 48 hours of patients picking up a mucosal infection, most commonly of the respiratory tract, they experience, or a significant number of patients experience visible hematuria, suggesting there is a very clear link between activation of the mucosal immune system and the nephritis that we see in IgA nephropathy. Uh, while this has been known for at least the last uh, almost 50 years, we still don't have an adequate explanation for this phenomena. But I think what it does point to is the intimate link between mucosal immune system activation and glomerular disease in this condition. Could I go to the next slide, please? So again, uh, just touching and reinforcing what Heather alluded to, we, it is becoming increasingly apparent that the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue play a central role in the pathogenesis of IgA nephropathy. And indeed, the largest meta GWAS, that you, as you can see uh, at the bottom part of the slide, the major pathway enriched when we looked for cake protein pathways was intestinal IgA immune synthesis. And uh, 
along with a whole series of other lines of evidence, really does point to the importance of mucosal immune system activation um, as the source of pathogenic IgA in this disease. So if we can go to the next slide. These are just two um, papers which, have re which really illustrate those links with the mucosal immune system. So the first is that if we look in the blood of patients with IgA nephropathy, we can see elevated levels of IgA antibodies against a whole series of mucosal antigens. And these are far more elevated in patients with IgA nephropathy than in healthy subjects or patients with other forms of kidney disease. And in this example, I've just chosen Helicobacter pylori as a, um, an antigen that lives within, the, uh, lives within the stomach. If we look at this IgA against mucosal antigens in more detail, again, as Heather alluded to, you can uh, see that this is polymeric it, and it carries those changes in the sugar molecules that are characteristic of the IgA that is deposited within the glomeruli. And therefore, we can assume that the IgA that is deposited in the glomeruli is of mucosal origin. Now, whether those cells live within the mucosal immune system or are mislocated to other sites is still not clear. But it's very, there is strong evidence to suggest that the IgA that deposits within the kidneys is from mucosally primed B cells. If we can go to the next slide. So this is just a summary of the, the pathogenesis of IgA. And if you look at, at the six o'clock position, you can see the primary abnormality is the formation of circulating immune complexes. And we believe the main substrate for formation of immune complexes is, as you can see directly above, the presence in the bloodstream of poorly galactosylated polymeric IgA molecules. And we have a number of different theories as to why these immune complexes develop. But, but what we do believe is that these poorly galactosylated IgA, IgA molecules are derived from the mucosal immune system. And therefore, targeting using a drug that targets the mucosal immune system could essentially turn this pathogenic cascade off at the very top of the cascade and therefore limit the generation of air circulating immune complexes, limit IgA deposition, and therefore limit the nephritis that develops as a consequence of misangial IgA deposition. So if we could go to the next slide. And so there has been work being conducted uh, that, that commenced in Sweden over the last five to seven years, really, with an initial pilot study by Benkfeldstrom using a product called Neficon. The Neficon is taken from the inflammatory bowel uh, disease arena and is a specific formulation of steroid, budesonide, coated in a very particular starch capsule that means that the budesonide is only released when it reaches the terminal ileum. Now, this is different to Entercort, which is the drug uh, that's used in inflammatory bowel disease, which releases the steroid over a much larger area of the gastrointestinal tract. But this drug has been specifically formulated such that it only delivers the budesonide to the terminal ileum, which is the area of greatest density of immune cells within the GI tract. And therefore, the um, rationale for this drug is this is giving a topical dose of steroids to the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue in the ileum with very little systemic absorption, principally due to first mass pass metabolism within the liver. Uh, following an initial pilot study that was conducted in 16 patients in Sweden, there was sufficient evidence of a, an effect in terms of proteinuria reduction to trigger the phase two study that was reported in the Lancet, which you can see in the bottom um, half of the slide. And what this study did was it looked at two different doses of Neficon, 16 milligrams, eight milligrams compared against placebo, in approximately 50 patients in each group. The drug was given for a nine month period with a three month uh, follow up period. And what the study showed was a significant reduction in proteinuria at nine months with the Neficon treatment, most marked with the 16 milligram treatment. And this therefore 
triggered the planning and delivery of the NEFIGARD study, which is a phase three registration study to determine the safety and efficacy of NEFICON in IGA nephropathy as a, in terms of getting this drug approved for treatment. So if we go to the next slide. So this is the study layout. Um, and I think it's important to, to really talk through this in a little bit of detail. So what you can see is that there is a screening period. Patients are only eligible if they have been on maximal tolerated dose of RAS blockade with good blood pressure control. And despite these maximal supportive efforts, have persistent proteinuria above one gram per 24 hours of proteinuria. I'll come to the inclusion and exclusion criteria in more detail on the next slide. So those patients that remain at high risk of progressive renal disease, despite maximal supportive therapy, are randomized to either neficon or placebo. There is then a part A of the study which mimics the phase two study where patients receive the treatment for nine months and then there is a three month follow up period with measurement of proteinuria at nine months being the primary outcome of the uh, part A of the study. Part B is a follow up uh, part of the study where patients are followed and the outcome there is the number of pa is the time it takes for the for patients to um, have a 30% reduction in GFR. As you can see on the right hand panel, there are two objectives. The part A primary objective is to assess the effect of neficon on urine protein to creatinine excretion over nine months compared to placebo, with the part B looking to see how that reduction in proteinuria translates to a protective effect on GFR. So if we go to the next slide, I just want to finish by really reiterating the inclusion and exclusion criteria. As I say, this is a study that is actively recruiting at the moment. Recruitment is on target, and clearly the, we would hope to have patients recruited as quickly as possible so that we can have a definitive answer on the effectiveness of this drug. And therefore, for people on the call, if you're interested, what we are looking for are patients over the age of 18, diagnosed within 10 years by renal biopsy, as I say, on a stable dose of maximally tolerated RAS inhibitor for three months prior to screening. Proteinuria based on two consecutive measurements are showing a proteinuria of greater than one gram per day or a UPCR greater than 0 0.8 grams per gram and an EGFR between 35 and under 90. Exclusion criteria are those that you can read here, but again, as Dana mentioned, we are excluding patients with secondary IgA and in particular HSP. We are not including patients with, kidney tra with a kidney transplant or who have poor risk factors, including high blood pressure. We don't want to include patients who have predefined gastrointestinal disorders because clearly this will affect the absorbance of the drug. And we are, we are excluding patients who have had significant immunosuppression in their immediate uh, past. Um, I'm going to finish here and hand over to Richard, who's going to talk about complement inhibition. Um, but as I, if anyone would like to have more information about this study, please don't hesitate to contact me uh, after the webinar. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Barrett. So our next and final presenter is uh, Dr. Richard uh, Lafayette uh, from Stanford University, where he's a professor of medicine and director of the uh, uh, Stanford Glomerular Disease Center. Dr. Lafayette will talk about emerging therapies for IgA nephropathy with, uh, as you've heard, a focus on complement targeting uh, agents, and in particular, OMS721, uh, currently in uh, phase three study. So Dr. Lafayette. Between, we can perhaps get uh, started with a few questions and perhaps the most important person to ask in the field would be patient voice. So uh, Schneider, Barney Schneider is the founding director of the IGA uh, Nephropathy Foundation of America. Uh, she kindly is joining us to represent patient voice and bringing along a uh, few questions from the patient group here for us. Uh, so Ms. Schneider, if you can introduce yourself and, and uh, tell us a little bit about your organization and then also share 
any questions or concerns coming from the patient perspective. I would be happy to. I'm honored to be on this call today. I'm super, super excited on behalf of myself and all of our patients. Um, I believe there's thousands of them now, over 12,000 in our Facebook group. Um, we're very excited. We're, we're very rarely a topic of conversation. So this is really good. And I do believe we have several patients on the call today. A uh, little bit of background. My son was diagnosed 15 years ago with IJ nephropathy and I was looking for somewhere to go, somewhere to turn, uh, get the support that I needed, and there wasn't any. So 15 years later, here we are, and we now have support for one another. Um, so there's been a lot of questions um, in our Facebook group. It's like a clearinghouse of people trying to help people, but um, we're always looking for answers from our doctors. One of the big, biggest things um, I think is the biggest problem with everybody is diet. Uh, gluten-free versus is keto diet safe? It seems to be occurring over and over. If anybody could shed some light on that. I know hygienophobia is an, a disease of inflammation. My son is gluten-free and I think it really helps him. But if you could um, answer that for some of our patients online, that would be awesome. So we can pass on this question to uh, our expert panelists, perhaps starting off uh, with Dr. Rich. Uh, you um, alluded with regards to the pathophysiology of IgA nephropathy. Can you comment on that? Sure. So um, this is a question that I get all the time in clinic as well. There's, there's no question that there is a link between gut health and gut immune responses and IgA uh, production. The link between diet though, and in particular gluten, uh, is quite shaky in IgA nephropathy. Dr. Barrett has done some work in this area and can share some results. Uh, but you know, for a subgroup, a very small subgroup of patients, there will be some anecdotal uh, associations, but from a scientific perspective and population perspective, we can't identify that gluten is uh, a major culprit in IgA nephropathy. So I do not generally advise a gluten-free diet. Uh, of course, if people feel better when they're gluten-free, because you know some people are sensitive to gluten, but not necessarily gluten intolerant, um, if they feel better, great, uh, but we do not advocate because I'm, the scientific data are really lacking. Um, and Dr. Barrett might be able to expand a little bit on his uh, work looking at intestinal permeability and IgA. From the paleo perspective, uh, weight and BMI are uh, associated with risk of progression, so not on the immune side, but on the general progression side of things. So being at a healthy weight is always optimal. I'm not a, a major proponent of the ketogenic diet uh, unless people have things like underlying gluco, uh, blood sugar, borderline diabetes, blood sugar intolerance, uh, where uh, any form of weight management tends to be healthy. So uh, we don't particularly recommend any type of diet aside from you know, low sodium uh, diet to people if they are healthy weight. If they are above uh, healthy weight, then any form of, of weight management seem, that is safe seems to be okay. And perhaps Dr. Barrett has a few comments. Yes, um, thanks Heather. I I, I agree with Heather. I don't think there's any systematic evidence that withdrawal of gluten helps everyone with IgA nephropathy, although there will be some people who have an underlying gluten sensitivity that will benefit. The only randomized study looking at gluten withdrawal in general IgA nephropathy patients failed to show any benefit or long-term benefit, should I say. So, so my advice in parallel with Heather's is that if you feel better on a gluten-free diet, then please continue. But I don't advise any particular dietary modifications as a rule of thumb in patients with IgA nephropathy, other than 
the general healthy life diet that we have, you know, the five a day, and if you're overweight, dietary restriction to try and get back to a normal BMI. But I don't think there's any evidence for any particular diet. And just like Heather says, I get asked this all the time. Uh, and uh, I think that a healthy diet is by far the most important uh, um, advice I can give my patient. So um, moving on, uh, talking about emerging therapeutic targets for IgA nephropathy, we'll be focusing on the Artemis trial, taking advantage of our new ability to block several components of complement. We've already reviewed that the current treatments for IgA nephropathy are lacking with blood pressure control, even using ACE inhibitors and angiotensin II receptor blockers, making a good impact, but um, only slowing the disease and for too many patients, allowing them to progress towards chronic kidney disease. Um, immunosuppression uh, in the form of steroids may be too dangerous for any perceived benefits, and cytotoxic drugs, mycophenolate, are unclear on their impact. Old studies with IVIG are still of some interest, but too expensive to use uh, with too little data. And again, diet is likely to be important. Fish oil is likely not to be, and tonsillectomy remains controversial without sufficient evidence. Next slide. So uh, as Heather nicely outlined, the complement system is of very focused interest in IJ nephropathy. Again, uh, with the development of immunofluorescence, we clearly saw the fact that tissue deposition of C3 was an important factor in IJ nephropathy. As you can see, the complement system relies on either the classical pathway, alternate pathway, or lectin pathway. But with the Artemis study, we take advantage of the development of OMS 721 or nars narsoplumab uh, to be able to block MAS2 and hopefully block downstream uh, cytokine-driven and cytotoxic-driven effects of complement. Next slide. And as Heather also alluded to, there is a large amount of circumstantial data linking complement activation and poor outcomes in IJ nephropathy, including genetic evidence, mostly looking at the alternate pathway and the fact that factor H may play a role, a lot of serologic evidence, looking at, again, alternative pathway activation in many patients who have IJ nephropathy, decreased serum complement levels, even relative decreased serum levels playing a role in um, the decline of kidney function that occurs. And then histologically, of course, there's evidence that C3 co-deposits with IgA nephropathy in the vast majority of cases, that other alternative pathway and lectin pathway components deposit in glomeruli, and that complement deposition is again associated with a worse prognosis and with progression of disease. And then finally, in uh, models of IgA nephropathy, IgA can activate the alternative pathway. Polymeric IgA can bind uh, membrane-bound lectin in vitro. Mesangial cells express C3A and C5A R1 and can respond to these complement fragments. And again, that there's evidence of cytokine production in response to the anaphylatoxins, which are part of an activated complement system. So again, there's very wide evidence that um, complement is activated in IgA nephropathy. Next slide. Um, there's further evidence on this slide. Uh, again, multiple studies showing an association between complement activation and worsened outcomes in IgA nephropathy. We can skip this and move to the next slide. And again, taking advantage of this idea of complement activation, you can shift your multi-hit hypothesis if you wanted to uh, of IgA nephropathy in that they're circulating galactose deficient IgA antibodies, that those antibodies um, lead to immune complexes, which then contain the uh, membrane-bound lectin and manin-associated serum proteinase 2 complexes. Um, 
and anti-glycan antibodies, which are bound to the galactose deficient IgA, that those immune complexes deposit on the mesangial cells, and therefore the lectin pathway of complement is indeed activated, and you get pro-inflammatory, pro-fibrotic cytokine production, um, leading to mesangial cell proliferation, podocyte damage in hematuria, tubular damage in proteinuria, and a loss of GFR. Next slide. So taking advantage of that hypothesis, Omaros went on to a phase two IGAN study design. There was a sub-study one, which just took a few patients. They had short screening visits in one week, uh, within four weeks, excuse me. They were then um, dosed for a 12-week course of therapy and they were followed up to see whether or not their proteinuria went down with therapy as an initial marker. And then we had sub-study sub two, where patients had screening visits, uh, where they were brought on or optimized for converting enzyme inhibitor, angiotensin II receptor blocker therapy. They were, again were dosed initially with um, 12 weeks of intravenous infusions. Uh, and compared to a group of patients who received vehicle. And then in follow-up, uh, a signal for proteinuria was followed, but patients could receive additional 12-week courses of active therapy and could be followed for two years. Next slide. And as you can see in this phase two study, First on the far right, you could see in four subjects who were treated, uh, who had substantial proteinuria, reduced kidney function, and were treated with 12 weeks, there was really an amazing reduction in proteinuria among this group that was sustained uh, throughout um, follow-up, which ranged between a half year and one year, with a mean percentile change in proteinuria of 72%. In sub-study two, where patients were treated uh, with active therapy versus vehicle, at the end of the first treatment phase, the first follow-up showed no difference with a reduction in proteinuria 20%. And then all patients received active drug and followed up uh, six to nine months later, the entire population again had a very impressive reduction of proteinuria of 61%. So while the evidence for the lectin pathway being active in patients with IgA nephropathy has been variable in only some patients who have active disease. In these phase two trials that just took all comer IgA nephropathy with substantial proteinuria on active therapy, there's a signal that their proteinuria can be reduced substantially. Next slide. And that brings us to the active global phase three study of narsoplumab in IgA nephropathy uh, with key inclusion and exclusion criteria as listed here. It's a study of adults with biopsy confirmed IgA nephropathy with a biopsy occurring within eight years prior to screening. Uh, they need to have a sustained proteinuria of greater than one gram per day um, despite maximal therapy with RAS inhibition. They need a mean of two proteinuria measurements greater than one gram per day at baseline and a GFR greater than 30 mils per minute. The key exclusion is pretty standard. If they're actively receiving immunosuppressants, they are out. If they get any other complement inhibitory therapy, they're out. Um, if they have rapid progression of their disease defined as a fall in GFR of more than 30 mils per minute in the half year before evaluation, if they have uncontrolled blood pressure, um, if they're, of course, women who plan to get pregnant, or if they have active diabetic nephropathy or another active disease. Next slide. And this is how the program looks for the phase three study, is that patients are again screened uh, to see if they have the right biopsy, proteinuria, and blood pressure. 
there's a run-in period of four to 12 weeks to assure that they're stable and that they have optimal blood pressure control and RAS blockade. They're then treated for 12 weeks in a one-to-one -one randomization to um, placebo, and then they are followed. And what's unique about this study is that the primary endpoint uh, will be at week 36 for proteinuria, uh, but patients can be retreated if they don't have an optimal response, and they can be retreated for an additional 12 weeks, at least every year, uh, for the secondary follow-up, which as you can see, will follow patients up to three years of follow-up looking at GFR. So the primary outcome is indeed the proteinuria signal, looking for a significant reduction in proteinuria, and then secondary outcome will be looking at stability of kidney function. And that's the Artemis trial, and I look forward to talking to you more about that and apologize for technical difficulties. So thank you for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Lafayette. Um, so perhaps now we could go back to uh, Bonnie. I know Bonnie had some additional questions from the patient community. Um, Bonnie, you on the line? Here, thank you. Um, before I go on, I just wanted to reiterate what um, Josh and the Nectro team said earlier. Uh, we have a lot more participants on the line when he was first speaking about the um, Kidney Health Gateway. It's a really, really important time for uh, these trials. So again, I please um, send your patients there and patients that are on, please visit Kidney Health Gateway. Um, it's such an important time that we're partners with Netcure on it. It's like our time. Um, so back to the questions, I did want to, it looks like a big question right now that I'm getting from the patients is the prediction tool. Should, we're very excited about that because many patients, when they hear about their prognosis, they're afraid. How long is it going to be? What is the time factor? How long do I have? What's, how's this going to affect my family? So with that being said, should they bring the information to their nephrologist about the tool if their nephrologist is not aware of it? Hello, this is uh, Rich Lafayette. Can I comment on that? Please. Sure. Yeah, so I, I always think patients should be activated and aware, and especially when there's an online prediction tool, it's really critically important that patients don't try to take the learnings from that tool without guidance from their physician, because the prediction tool is beautiful for populations. How it actually will predict the outcome in an individual patient is yet to be seen. There may be a tremendous amount of variability and discussing that with their physician is critically important. And on the flip side, I would say it's also critically important that physicians understand the prognosis of their patients. And just like it took decades for the MDRD equation and subsequent equations to hit home, there are some physicians who don't understand fully the risks of IgA nephropathy to lead to progressive renal dysfunction. And the prediction tool is very helpful to at least bring people into a general ballpark and get the physician and patient on the same page in terms of what to consider in anticipating their care. Um, if I could just make a quick uh, comment as well. Um, I was involved in the development of the tool. Sorry, we have, uh, I'm in the hospital, so sorry for the background. Um, is the door closed? Sorry. So uh, the tool, as Dr. Barrett mentioned, does it does use population data. The goal of the tool is to give more individual specific data, um, but there are a couple of in important points about it. Firstly, very specific criteria need to be entered into the tool itself. So, for example, the pathology report variables and those will likely require some help and guidance with the nephrologist um, to sit together and do that. The second is that the uh, data that are entered into the prediction tool, at the moment, it's only validated for how the patient looked at the time of the biopsy. So if it's been five years since someone's biopsy, the five-year data cannot be entered into the tool. It's only at the time of biopsy. The last uh, point is that the impact of treatment is not evaluated in this tool. 
it does not tell us what drug to use and it doesn't tell us how likely a drug is going to be effective. And in fact, we hope that in the future, the prediction tool is not accurate because we hope that we can change the outcome of patients with interventions like the ones mentioned in these clinical trials. So what is the use of the, the prediction tool? In my mind, it gives a profile of likelihood to run into problems um, and most importantly, helps us design better clinical trials. So in the past, we can see from several studies, patients who likely would not have done badly were the ones that were recruited or represented into a particular study. And that might be why the results of a study are not terribly impressive. The patients were going to do well no matter what we did. Similarly, patients who are going to at very high risk of progression, we don't want them to be the only ones included in a study because that might make a potentially useful medication look ineffective. So there are many uses of the for the tool, but it is by all means not um, a crystal ball. And we really hope that the profile that a patient fits into at the time of the biopsy doesn't necessarily fit exactly with what's going to happen with that patient in the future because we're hoping that we can intervene uh, with some newer medications. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rich, and uh, thank you much, uh, Bonnie, for passing on these questions. I think uh, being in the limbo and uncertainty about, about what's going to happen is, is a major concern of every patient, but equally as uh, for the physician. I think we, had two, we have now exciting opportunities at least to intervene, and two trials got uh, discussed today. I have a, a question for uh, Dr. Barrett and uh, Lafayette, uh, who are enrolling in these trials and and we see patients in clinical trials. What are the big barriers of enrolling patients into your trials? Uh, do have you have you perceived? And and how can we increase the number of patients who can join into these trials and and uh, overcome those? Um, so a question to those who are enrolling. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm happy to go first if you like. So, so in the UK, we really don't have any problem encouraging our patients to get involved in clinical trials. Um, we have a, a very good network and I think the NEFCURE portal um, is a fantastic innovation that's encouraging. In fact, I've already been contacted by patients in the UK through that portal. I think it's a great way of connecting interested patients with interested clinical trial centres. Um, clearly the UK is very small compared to the United States, but we do have the ability to encourage patients to be involved through social media. So Bonnie mentioned the Facebook page. We have a Facebook page in the UK. Getting information out to patients and empowering patients and letting them know there are clinical trials out there for them. And even if their local hospital isn't interested or doing that study, that there is a place nearby that could recruit them. And so I am often putting patients in touch with local centres where the trials are recruiting to ensure that they have the opportunity to be involved in a clinical trial. And while I accept, you know, most English cities are only 50 miles from one another, it's a different kettle of fish in the US. I still think that I've heard of great examples where US trialists are putting patients in touch with other centres and getting them involved. I don't know whether Richard wants to comment on that. I would, I, I would simply add that it's just critically important to get word out to physicians taking care of patients with IgA nephropathy and patients. There's a lot of fear and mistrust sometimes that investigators really are abiding by standard of care, that patients will get close follow-up and good concern for whether they need to exit studies that they really will be very good communication between the study team and referring physicians. And that certainly will send patients back to referring physicians and that they won't lose their relationship, either patients with their physicians or physicians with their patients. But clearly it's critically important to move the dial forward. Uh, these studies and others allow patients the opportunity and physicians the opportunity 
to create a brighter future, uh, to lead to new therapies, to understand the disease better, and that's just critically important. Thanks so much, uh, Richard. I'll just ask a follow-up. Uh, so the inclusion exclusion criteria um, for these two studies, they're a bit subtly different. Um, uh, I believe you're involved in both. I mean, are there special patient characteristics you'd look for um, for each uh, study uh, in terms of directing individual patients? Uh, that's a great question, Kirk. I, I, I don't think there's a real differential. Uh, we, we try to sit patients down, at least at my center, talk about the drug development, what the individual trial offers them, and what the sort of experience will be within the trial. There are subtle differences, like the time from biopsy, uh, how low the GFR goes with it being a little bit lower in Artemis than in Neficon, but a lot of the patients overlap. And as both trials are geared towards reducing inflammation, reducing the risk for progressive fibrosis, most patients can end up making their own decision. So I try not to have a predisposition of what kind of patient I think goes into what kind of trial, but I try to describe it very well for the patients and try to help them make their own personal choice move forward. Thank you. Are there general questions from uh, those in attendance? Remaining, we have 72 people still on the call. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi, so I'm a, a patient, 44 years old, just got diagnosed uh, about six months ago. And I, I could probably speak for most of us online that are patients uh, with this disease. You know, as we, as we look at these trials, um, and as you were just discussing, and, and we try to, to figure out which trial we would want to uh, try to get randomized into, could you help us understand any one of you on the panel a little bit more in depth on the differences on the pathways, like the lectin pathway, the C complement versus, you know, Nefagard and Nefacom with the budesonide blockade of the IgA, maybe galactose deficient galact, um, immunoglobulin A as well, um, just so that we can maybe have a better idea of which, which agent, although both promising, might help steer us towards one versus the other, um, just so we have a better understanding of it, the, because they're two different, two different, two different uh, medications, right, obviously. So maybe a little deeper understanding for us along those lines would be very helpful. Dr. Barrett, did you want to opine on that? Yeah, I mean, that is the question every patient asks me, which one is going to be most likely to help me in my kidney disease? And I have to be perfectly honest, and it's not the answer you want to hear, is I don't know. And that's why we're doing the trials. And actually, I think in the fullness of time, what we will find that us as clinicians will end up using a number of these drugs together because they're impacting on the disease at different parts in the pathogenic cascade. Um, and at the moment, if, if I personally had IgA nephropathy, I'm, I would be looking at each of these trials and I would, be, I would not pick one over another because I think they're more or less likely to work. I think, as Richard said, I would sit you down and I would talk you through the practicalities of what the trial involves. And I would go through what that entails for you and your daily life and allow you to come to a decision. But I would not promote one of these above another, knowing, and everyone on the panel has a long experience of, of understanding of the pathogenesis of IgA. And I personally cannot say that one of these will be better than the other. I think they're all likely to be incredibly useful in the fullness of time if we show that they work. But I wouldn't say to a patient because I have all of these trials running in my center. What I do is I go through how the trials work and I explain why, what the rationale is, but I can't, I don't have enough information to steer a patient to one rather than the other, I'm afraid. I don't know whether anyone else on the panel wants to make any other comment. Yeah, Dr. Rissick or Arish, any comments on that? 
I mean, I, I agree with Dr. Barrett. Fundamentally, we shouldn't be offering patients access to multiple trials if we have some knowledge that one will work better than another. So I encourage patients to really look at what, try, what study fits best into their involvement. So for example, um, the OMROS study is you know, quite frequent visits and uh, some of those visits can take a little longer. Uh, so if you live three hours from the hospital that's offering the study, that might be less convenient. And it, it really does come down to those, to those factors. Uh, Neficon is, uh, has some, uh, they're also at slightly different phases of drug development. Uh, and so it, it's biologically, it's really tough to say that one is likely to work better than the other and clinically uh, clinicians who are offering those studies and uh, as a disclosure we are also running both studies we, we can't go into this knowing that one of them is better so, so I would echo exactly what dr. Barrett said the only comment I would add is sometimes highlighting the what you mentioned the logistics of the trial in terms of involvement IV versus oral agents and then the, you know, some of the side effect profile may be known from earlier phase uh, data, and that may be worthwhile to share to help guide what patients expect. Great, and perhaps with this, uh, we, we let it uh, be for this session. We could certainly speak uh, much longer than that. We already uh, went beyond 30 minutes and thanks so much our speakers uh, today uh, Dr. Risk, Dr. Barrett, Dr. Reich and Dr. Lafayette uh, to be with us and share their expertise. Uh, we want to thank uh, the NEFQ Foundation for uh, helping bring this alive and the Kidney Health Initiative and ASN to supporting this uh, and endorsing our program here. Um, we have the same session again, similar, on FSGS uh, next month, uh, September 3rd. So please uh, come back and join us again for, for the discussion on clinical trials in that domain. And in the meantime, uh, thank all our participants who joined, I think, from as uh, west as Hawaii and as east as Malaysia today. Uh, so truly, clinical trials are a global effort, uh, and trials are recruiting internationally. So. Uh, connect uh, connect with the community, uh, check out the Kidney uh, Gateway Initiative, the website, and uh, we will uh, distribute that on our email for uh, trial identification uh, and uh, study enrollment. So thank you all again. Have a wonderful day, night, uh, evening, wherever you are, and we we'll see you back next month, September 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. You. Thank you.